Because we know people who should be successful, but what? They're not successful. Why? So that's his why buy. But what is he afraid of? My personal style of education, but still entertain them, bring them along with stories, right? You can't wait to tell your colleague. You can't wait to go to work and tell somebody. And you're like, oh my God, I can't wait. So what happened? If you haven't seen my TV show, you should get cable. That's what we need to do. From doing a TV show to doing corporate events, I've been so lucky to connect with many passionate entrepreneurs worldwide. What I've learned from a business perspective, because this is the formula for success, no matter who you talk to, attitude will drive your behavior. Would you agree? and your behavior will drive your consequences every single time. Right, we got the concept. Okay, we got the concept. We got, we got the equipment, right? We got the brand. You guys got that. And then again, we got the content that we create. That's the easy part. This is the big one, the big C, which is the commitment. What should you do? That's right, all right. 10 Xers, do not fail me. True test, here it comes. There's skill, and then there's will. Listen to what I'm saying. There is skill, and then there is will. And here's the interesting thing. I know a lot of people who have a lot of skill, but have no what? Will, right? You ever look at somebody who's successful, and you say, why them, why not you? Yes, okay, that's me too. You have more control, but your costs are also gonna be what? Higher. Now, here's where some of the magic is starting to kick in. You can talk to any CEO in the B2B business, any CEO. You walk into his office and they only care about three things. People too. Yeah, he with the suit, put it up. There you go. I hope you can see this. I'll try to draw big. Let's pretend for a moment that I have seven territories. You remember I wrote that out? Yes or no? Boom, territory two, territory three, all the way to territory number one, seven. So now I've segmented my market. So content is gonna start being created by machines. And I'm telling you right now that those people, you guys, the content creators that connect with people are the ones that are gonna win. Some people think, well, it won't work for my industry. Really? It'll work for any industry. Trust me. The majority of the time when we're looking to fix something, repair something, or learn something, where do we go? YouTube. We don't even want to read anymore. We go to YouTube. Tell me if I'm wrong. Tell me if I'm wrong. When you're doing your thing, beautiful things begin to happen. It's like the law of attraction kicks in. You know what I mean? It's almost like you're in line with the universe. Everything works. And when you do your thing, everybody gets an automatic MBA, which stands for what? Mega bank account money. Are you with me? So we don't want to do a thing. We want to do a what? Beautiful. Put it all together for Victor Antonio. Here we go. All right, there we go. I'm not here to mess around. You ready to learn? Yes or no? That's how it works in today's market. Whether it's B2B or B2C, you see the similar pattern. How do you just, you know, in other words, say you've got to start doing these things, pushing them, but also encouraging them. Oh, look at this. This is where it gets, dude, this is, this is like so interactive with audiences. Matt, can you imagine this with your customers? Check this out. Now, what does all this have to do with selling? It has everything to do with selling. All right, welcome to another Sales After Dark because money never sleeps. Anyway, this is episode, whew, 
93 on our way to 100. Uh, by the way, if you're watching this on the replay, here's how it works. I'm going to say hi to my friends first, which should take about three to five minutes. Then I'll jump into some content, description below. And then after the content, I'll take questions and answers. So let's kick this off with, let's see who's on here. Ernesto Flores says, I am first. Ernesto, yes, you are, man. Yes, you are. Thank you for joining me. We got Jarmo Kilstrom. Good morning from the Thriller in Manila, the Philippines, man. Thank you for joining me, man. And Persian Chris goes, nope. All right, that's cool. My girl, Mia Knox, West Coast in the house. Mia, you know I love when you're here. TJ, my man, he is here. Good to go. Persian Chris chiming in for the second time. Victor, you are the man. No, Persian Chris, you're the man. Thank you very much for joining us. And then we have... Steph, Steffi, Chicago in the house. That's right, Northwest Side. There you go. All right, Brian Gator, what's happening? Good evening from Las Vegas. Also, where money never sleeps. Definitely the strip, man. I love the old. I love the old Las Vegas strip better. Uh, good day, Master VA, to all the SAD peeps. Brian, so early, love it. So new. What's happening? Hello, how you doing, sir? Right back at you, Ryan Nobrega. I love that. Greetings from Myrtle Beach. By the way, Brian, just Ryan, just the kind of a side note, like brega means hustle in Spanish. When you brega, so it means no brega means no hustle. That's your last name. Translate it for you. Puerto Rican style. All right, Sparrow's Tale, what's happening? Glad you're here. Uh, saying hi right there. All right, everybody saying hi. Where's JJ? Have no idea. My man, if you love the intro, you love Chris Stone. By the way, Chris Stone has been doing some sales after dark replays for me. Uh, I just posted two over the holiday weekend, man. So check it out, man. He does a great job uh, on the replays. What we're doing is we're taking off the intro and the comments at the end. It's just pure content. This was Chris's idea. So, you know, again, check out Chris Stone, man. He is awesome. Let's let the magic kick in, man. I love it. Vinay, what's happening? Glad you're back, man. TJ, how's it going? Man, it is going, man. A little Thanksgiving. I didn't join you guys on Thursday. Obviously, it was Thanksgiving here in the U.S., uh, but I'm back, man. Good morning from Mumbai, India, man. One day I'm going to go to India, man. One day, one day. Uh, Mike K from Orlando, man. Love it, man. Uh, just in time, Matthew Dekaitis. Did I get that right if I did it? Number 93, that's right, man. On the way to 100, man. Hello, Victor. Good morning from Singapore, a very fine city. Here in Atlanta, my man Spencer Ripley, Vinay from Chicago, homeboy, there you go, love it, man. Thank you for stopping by. Oscar Correo Contreras, what's up, bro? From the home is Hurricane Nicaragua, love it, man. Luther Bosquez, man, how you doing, man? Good to have you here. Ed Hamilton, getting after it, that's the only way to do it, man. Oscar says, man, fan for the last 10 years, my man, thank you, Oscar. All right, so let's jump into some content tonight. So what I want to talk about is, I think you'll like this topic. Uh, it's, I want to talk about what happens, and this really applies to B2B. So just forgive me, this is going to be a B2B night. But I think you'll learn something, even if you're in B2C. One of the things we often talk about, you guys know the sales velocity equa uh, equation, right? So the sales velocity equation is equal to the number of opportunities, right, multiplied by your close rate, multiplied by your average, I say average, deal size, right, and then divided by the sales cycle. So for example, if you got 100 opportunities in your pipeline, your close rate's less 30, 40%, you multiply that by the average deal size, let's say on average you sell $20,000, $30,000, divided by the number of days that take you close the deal, it gives you a velocity, right, dollars per day, or you can do dollars per month, depending on what you want to do. What I want to do is, I want to focus on two things. I want to focus on, let me get some red going here. I want to focus on right here, let's talk about increasing the close rate, but also let's talk about shortening the sales cycle. Because if we can increase the close rate and shorten the sales cycle, we're going to sell more faster. So that's kind of the whole, the big picture of what we're going to talk about tonight. It's close rate and how do you shorten the sales cycle? So for example, if you're in a B2B business or even B2C or business to home, business to residential, let's say that your close rate is two months or a month, doesn't matter, take your pick. Uh, you know, Again, depending on what you are selling, I mean, I've seen, uh, when I sold B2B, I mean, we could have one year, 12 months, maybe even 18 months on the sales cycle. So let's say it's six months, 
Some of you can say it's two months. If we can shorten that by a few weeks, I'm sure you would agree with me that that would benefit us all, right? Because we know time kills all deals. So the longer the sales cycle is, the more likely that deal is going to stall and no decision is going to be made or we lose it. So if we can shorten that sales cycle, that's kind of what we're looking for. So keep that in mind. Let's shorten the sales cycle because if I shorten the sales cycle, here's what's interesting, I can increase my close rate. This is important. Those two, most people never talk about those two relationships. If I can shorten the sales cycle, I can probably increase my close rate. Now, that was data point number one. Data point number two, which I've talked about in the past. Today, in a B2B scenario, the number of decision maker is up to 11, man, 11 people to make a buying decision. 11 people in a B2B complex sale, typically to make a buying decision. And we know that if the number of decision maker increases, the probability of a sale goes what? Down. So again, what we want to do is we have to deal with this. There's no way we can get around that. So again, keep this in mind. We're dealing with a lot of different people. How do we sell to a lot of different people? Hold that thought. Hold that thought. I'm going somewhere. I'm going somewhere. Just let me go. Just let me go. I'm going somewhere. Now, let's say that you sell a SaaS product, right? You have some type of SaaS product, software as a service, right? And let's say, this is the scenario I want to frame tonight. Let's say that somebody comes online, right? Goes online. This is you, goes, on, goes to your website, and then they want to actually see a demo, right? And so let's say that today's, let's just say it's, it's December 1st, right? 12-1, they want to see a demo. And so they schedule a demo, or you get back to them, whatever it may be. You can, you know, um, uh, give them a calendar. They can actually pick a date or a time, or you can kind of negotiate what would be a good time. But let's say that the demo is scheduled for 12-7. Maybe sooner, but that's demo day, right? 12-7. So between the time we've set the demo, or connected with them to get a demo going, to actually setting the day, there's about seven days there. It's a whole week. Here's the question. Here's a good question. What do you do in the meantime? What do you do in the meantime? A lot of companies don't do anything. They just wait for that demo date to come. In fact, let's even shorten this. Let's call it 12-3. 12-1, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, right? What do you do in between these dates? What do you do? That's what I want to answer today. Because I think that if we can insert some activity right there, we can increase the probability of this demo going well. How do you do that? The question is, what can I do right here? What can I do right there to basically prep the people, the 11 decision makers, for this demo. Again, let's think about it this way, because here's why I think selling is going. In fact, in the future, what you're going to find out, it's not so much about selling. It's about how people buy, finding the why in how people buy, right? That's what I always talk about. But it's becoming more true every day. So selling isn't going to be hard. What's going to be hard is buying. Let me say this again. This is important. Selling isn't going to be hard. What's going to be hard is buying because the buyer has so many different people banging away, so many vendors coming at them, so much information that they don't know how to make a buying decision. And this is where you, the salesperson, are going to be that type of salesperson where you're not going to pressure, 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 close. What they're looking for is somebody to help them make a buying decision. This is important. How do you help them make a buying decision? Now, in order to do this, if you're selling in a complex sale, because that's the frame for tonight, complex sale, we know that one of the biggest things you can do to get into a company, to sell into a big company in an enterprise situation, is to get a champion on your side. So when I say a champion, this is somebody that loves your product. By the way, the folks in the challenger sale call this person a mobilizer. That's another, another word they use for it, a mobilizer. Whatever it is, the champion or the mobilizer, this is the person inside the company who's going to help promote and push your product. This is your, this is your cheerleader that's in the company pushing your product, right? Now, I've already told you that within a company, you could have 11 decision makers. I've already just said that, 11 decision makers. The question then becomes, how do we equip that champion within the company to really spread the message to one to 11 decision makers? How do we do that? 
It's something we don't think about or talk about, right? So for example, day one, Monday, we set the meeting for a demo. We're going to have it on Wednesday. What can I give the champion, the mobilizer, in the meantime, so they can help me sell inside? It's almost like the Trojan horse. Once you've got a champion inside the company, then our job becomes not to try to sell the company. Our job becomes, here's the phrase, is to enable, enable this buyer to sell, to enable this buyer within the company to sell. And that's the question. How do you enable it? That's the framework I want to set tonight. How do you enable a buyer, a champion, a mobilizer within a company to sell your product or your service? Keep in mind, we're eventually going to meet with the customer, but in the meantime, how do we equip the mobilizer, the challenger, to go in there and sell on our behalf? We have to make it easy for them. Now, let's step back. We talked about this in the past. There's four types of buyers, right? Categories of buyers, right? I should say, there's the management buyer. We talked about this. There's the user buyer. There's the technology buyer. There's the economic buyer, right? You can have multiple management buyers. By the way, the acronym is MUTE, right? Okay? And I didn't come up with this. This is basically something that's known. Management, users, people who use the actual product, technology buyer. Here you can have like a CIO, a CTO, maybe even have people, somebody from operations in there. The economic buyer could be purchasing. It could also be legal, right? Somebody, legal, contracts, the whole bit. And so users could be several. Management could be a bunch of CXOs. This could be chief marketing officer, chief sales officer. But these are the four main categories. If we have a champion within the company, if we have a champion within the company, by the way, if you're having comments on the site, I'll get to them in a little bit. But if you have somebody inside the company, what do we give our champion so they can sell more effectively? Well, first of all, we have to map things out for the champion. We have to say, champion, look, there's four types of buyers in your organization. So this is, would be like a matrix we would give them, right? And the first thing we're going to do is give the champion our mobilizer within the company. We're going to give that champion, let's call these talking points, right? This is important. So by talking points, I mean, if, I, if I'm talking to, let's say, a CXO or CEO, what would be the top three things I would mention about the product or service we offer to the CEO? If I got a user, what would be the top three things? If I got a technology buyer, a CIO, a CTO operation, what would be the top three things about my product or my software that I would want to tell them about? And if I got an economic buyer, what would be the top three things? Imagine giving this to your champion. So as your champion is working the organization, working through the hierarchy, working through the organizational chart, they know what to say to the right person. Now, this is all building up to getting to the demo, but this is a way of giving your champion content, talking points, what they can say to the CIO, the CTO, the CEO, the CMO, the CSO, whatever it may be. Let's give them the talking points. So that's one thing we can do. We can arm them with what to say. The second thing we can do is knowing, here's where, here's now where we're going to go into sniper mode. Sniper mode. What if, if I'm trying to sell a product or a service, too often what we do is we send people a video link, like go watch this video. And one, it's a general video, right? Two, it's maybe a long general video. Big mistake, big mistake. Nobody's going to watch it. I've seen people send me video links with 45 minutes. Do you think I've watched that video? No. But what if we create, I'm going to call it V5. V5 stands for what if I create a five-minute video based on these talking points, right? I create a five-minute video that I can actually send to anybody here. Now, I'm going to give my champion these videos or the links to these videos. And these videos are no more than five minutes. If you can make them three, even better. But these videos are going to talk about these talking points. Now, by the way, what are these talking points? The talking points are pain points, things that the actual customer wants to hear. So for example, if you're selling a software as a service, maybe within that product, they want to look at, let's say, analytics. One of the things that management loves to look at is data. So one of the things I know they want to learn about is 
How do we analyze the data? How do we use predictive analytics? How do we even use maybe AI, artificial intelligence, to do some predictive analysis? Maybe these are the talking points. And by the way, we're looking at the data maybe to figure out what new markets to go after. How can we grow our revenue? Again, talking points, but the video really supports these talking points. If you go to the user, I can talk about the user, but what, the, what does the user want to know? How easy is it to use? How much training will I need? Will it do all the things I currently do? And what else can it do to help me save some time? That's what the user. So maybe I can create a, a three to five minute video just for the user. You're getting the idea, right? So all of a sudden, I have these videos with these talking points. And again, I'm arming my champion. I'm arming my person that's going in there. And last but not least, last but not least, if you know what type of company you're going after because you've done the research, you're very focused on a certain niche, then the third thing we're gonna give them is a case study. What if we give our champion a case study? And in that case study, we highlight how it impacts everything that management's concerned about, what if we talk about the ease of use? What if we talk about technology? It's expandable, it's upgradable, so forth and so on. It's upgradable, it's expandable, it's interoperable. You can use it with this, you can use it with that. What if we let them know that? And the bottom part is the economic buyer. The economic buyer wants to know what? What's the total cost of ownership? What's the return on investment? Now we give them some case studies. This is what we give our champion. But I can, let me just squeeze this down even more. Because I want to add one more. And think about this. But let me add one more. We can arm it with one more thing. And this is a big one. Let me just add that one in there. This is the bonus one. Forrester did an interesting study. This data point is mind-blowing. Data point is mind-blowing. Basically, what they said is 67%. That's two-thirds. 67% of decisions are made from recommendations by peers. 67% of buying decisions are made from recommendations from peers, people they know or companies they know. What if we can get some testimonials from people who are using the product or using the service that are in the same industry? What if we can get that? And what if we can add, again, these could be videos as well. These could be videos or actually written testimonials, whatever you want. But now imagine that this is what you give your champion and you give it to them in a, such a way that they'll be able to use it. They'll have, first of all, the talking points are very clear. So when they're inviting, for example, now let's go back to, let's go back to this. Let's, let's pull it all together. And then I'll just take some questions. So again, I connected with the company, right? And I want a demo. So 12-1, I connected and I want the demo done on 12-3, right? So, before the demo day rolls around, before we do the demo, what we're gonna do is try to connect, send some information here, but also this third day here, 12-2, where nothing is happening, why don't we have our champion send out the videos with some talking points, maybe the testimonials. You'll get the idea, and all of a sudden, the day before you actually do the demo, you're sending out little pieces of information, and imagine your champion talking to the management level team and saying, by the way, here's the reason you should attend this demo. We're gonna cover this, 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 and this, and by the way, here's a quick video, and here's a case study to go with it, right? And then imagine inviting users specifically. They have the content, they have the talking points, they have the video, sends a separate video. Then the technical buyers, same thing, talking points, send the technical points. You get the idea. Now this is a lot of work, I get that, but think about this. How long, how long would it really take between you and me, that if I had a great product that I'm selling, how long would it take for you and I, our team, to get together and go through the talking points based on each of these buying groups? It won't take that long. Now, imagine, how long would it take, once we have the talking points, how long would it take us to put together a quick three to five minute video explaining some of the talking points? You could even personalize it. Now, you might have a challenge here, getting a good case study. That might take a little time, but worth investing. And in testimonials, again, if you've been around and if you have a good customer base, good customer portfolio, you can probably get some easy testimonials. But this is what we're arming our champion with. This is what we give the champion.
because again, we're not going to be there to sell them inside the organization. There's no way that I'm going to get access to 11 people. But if I train my champion to sell because I'm selling through my champion, if I can train my champion to sell, then I got a salesperson inside the organization. And that makes it powerful. Again, what if we can utilize this time to condition the clients? What if we can have a champion go in there and condition them? Now, I know, I know, I know, I know, because I know you. You're thinking, well, Victor, what if I don't have a champion? What if I don't have anybody within an organization? I feel your pain. So here's, here's what you can do. Here's the alternative. Let's go, let me erase this. Same scenario, but this time you don't have a champion, right? The date was set up here. The demo was here. We're going to do the demo here. What can you do? What can you do, right? Well, here's what you can do. Very simple. What if, and I'll just, let me go to the next page. I'm just a separate page. What if we put together, you and I, we put together a survey. And this is something we're going to send to everybody who's involved with a demo. In other words, we're going to ask our connection. This is the person that says, hey, we'd like you to do a demo. Can we do it on Wednesday? And you said, sure. And then what you can do is send them basically a survey. Like, and the survey will be broken up into two pieces, right? Who's gonna attend? Who's gonna be there, right? And then you can ask for the people that are gonna be there, right? Ask who's gonna be at the meeting. That's one way. And maybe you can ask, you can, we can create a survey. Let me just draw lines here. We can create a survey, very simple. I've seen this done many times, where you can say, what are some of the issues you like to discuss? And all you have to do is check the boxes. Imagine sending that out the very same day. So I send out this survey. As soon as we schedule the time, Wednesday, for the demo, I send out the survey. On day two, Tuesday, 12-2, I send out a reminder to get the survey back. If I get the survey back, by the time we get to the demo, I have the content I need. I have the content I need to actually have a great conversation and do a great demo. Now, one of the things I like to tell people is that you got to have real information going into any demo. And again, what customers expect is not for you to walk in with 100 questions. That's why a survey between the days that you're setting up the demo is a powerful tool. It's really easy to use. Your job is to make that survey so easy they can just go click, 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 click. These are the things we want to talk about. These are the things we want to see. And then, bam, return. That's what you want. Now, think about it. If I can get more people in this one demo as opposed to just one person, because again, studies have shown that on average, it takes about maybe four to five demos, four to five demos, maybe six to close a deal, depending on the company, right? Four, five, or six demos. That's a lot of demos. And you can imagine if you got four, five, or six demos, that's stretching everything out by the time everybody gets coordinated, because you know how it works, right? First demo, one person shows up. And then the person goes, I really like that. I think I'll bring my boss. Then you have to set up a second demo. And they bring their boss. And then the boss says, you know what? I need to get other people involved. And you get the idea, right? But what if in that first demo, using a survey, we actually highlight who should be in that meeting? And now we kind of give our person of contact an opportunity to say, hey, invite these other people because these are the issues we're going to discuss. And again, a lot of this stuff could be done through a survey. But the real push here is that if I can get more people involved using some type of survey or arming my champion with the information, I can get more people in the first demo. And instead of doing four, five, or six demos, let's say it's five. Let's say it's five demos on average to close a deal. What if using this strategy, arming my champion or doing surveys before we do the demo, what if we can reduce that demo number from five to three? All of a sudden, my deal closes as far as sales cycle goes down from two months, maybe to one month. That's what we're looking to do. So I wanted to talk to you about that today. If you don't have a software demo, I get it, but I think it's something worth considering. Two big points here. One is you want to arm your champion inside the company with content that they can have talking points, maybe videos they can share, case studies and testimonials. And what you also want to do, if you're going to do a show and tell, the dog and pony show to speak, you want to make sure in the first meeting you get as many decision makers as you can in that first meeting. And that is it for this Sales After Dark episode. I will now take questions, man. That was a lot of content, man. So I hope, I, I know I gave it quickly in a short period of time, but let's see what we got. 
on the comments. I'm looking forward to these comments right now. I got to fit it. Let me see. Okay, let me go back all the way to the top because there's a lot of comments scrolling by. If I miss yours, type it in again. I don't mean to ignore you. Uh, Arvin just jumped in, so thank you, man. And I got—I think I missed you earlier, Arvin, so sorry about that. Uh, we got Sean. I think we had you. No, Sean Suresh. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Spencer, we got you here. Hello from Chicago. Got some of those. Got some of those. Got some of those. Sorry about that. Uh, and then I think right here, uh, something about at Frisbee. John Frisbee, our boy is here. All right. Love it. Joseph James, you're back, man. Thank you, man. Hey, guys. Good to have you back, JJ, man. Thank you, man. Oh, hey there, JJ. Welcome back. Uh, da, da, da. Everybody say hi to each other. Cool. Carol Urbanowski, leave them alone. Okay. All right, I don't know who that, or irritate the prospect. Oh, I don't know. I don't know what that means. Can you help me out, Carol, a little bit? Give me some more, give me some more words in there. Research, learn about the customer, find relevant stuff about your customer. I agree, Vinay. Ask the right questions, always a good strategy. Uh, Ryan, hello, love these night episodes. Thank you, Ryan, for joining us, man. I know you're taking time out of your evening, man. I appreciate you. Your recent interview with Brent Adamson had some terrific insight into the new buying practices and great uh, key factors buyers are looking for. Great interview. Bravo, Victor. Uh, check out what Brian is referring to as my sales influence podcast. I'm telling you, I'm, I got some great guests. Uh, I, I started doing interviews this year. I'd not done them in the past. And so I'm up to uh, interview number 15 or 16, something like that. Chris Stone's doing a great job editing my stuff. And so check out some of these interviews. But Brent Adamson, one of the authors of The Challenger Sale, and I personally think one of the leading thought leaders when it comes to sales and how sales is changing. Uh, I follow him and I'm telling you, uh, you got to check out the interview. He's a great dude, man. I love his stuff. Uh, sorry I'm late. Pete, that's okay, man. Glad you're here, man. Glad you're here. Uh, better late than ever, Pete. You got it, man. L, hey, man, if you're live, can you please confirm now by saying hi? Hi. Okay, I was in my my groove there, so everybody always asks me if I say hi. Glad to see you here again, man. Uh He's live, Al. He's live. Thank you for uh, looking out for me. Brian is making me hungry. All right. I don't know what that is, man. Superb point. So new. Thank you very much. Um, do the videos need to be professionally edited? Can they be more video blog style? Good question. Uh, I don't think they need... Well, here's the thing is, if it's software, for example, let me because there's so many ways you can slice and dice. As long as they look pro is the short answer, Dean, right? As long as they look pro, that's the short answer. The, For example, in many cases, let's say you're just doing some screenshots, right? Or some screen, you can record the actual screen. Then there's so many software uh, tools out there. I like Loom. I always recommend Loom. Uh, Loom.com because it's only like four or five bucks a month. And with Loom.com, Dean, uh, you know, you can have the, the, the screen, uh, full screen, and you can do screen recording, and then it puts a little bubble of you talking about what's on the screen. So that looks really pro, and you can do that without a lot of production costs. Now, on the personalized videos, uh, I would say that you got to be careful with that. I, uh, the way I would do it to make sure, because you got to walk the line, right? Because if it's too personalized, it's too personal, then it, it may not work. What I would do is, to play it safe, if you have a small budget. By the way, if you have a big budget, do the professional videos, right? But I'm assuming you don't have a big budget. If you don't have a big budget, you can do use Loom to do the screen record, right? With your face off to the side. Another strategy that I think looks high end but doesn't cost a lot of money is if you record, you screen record within PowerPoint. And then you can do the same thing. There's software tools out there where you can record with PowerPoint so you'll show the slide full screen, but your head, your talking head, is off to the side pointing and doing certain things. And an easy way of doing that is you do a screen record, right? The way I do it sometimes, I do a screen record with, I use a Mac, so I use a, a Keynote. And what I do is I record the screen, and then in the, at the same time, I have my video camera running, right? So uh, I don't know if I'm explaining myself, Dean, but I have the video camera running. And so then what I do is uh, I go into the movie editor, like Movie Maker, and this is full screen keynote, and then I just put the, I make the, I shrink the video, and then I put my head right there, and then I explain the things right there, and it looks really pro. So that's one way of doing it without a budget, and so, but it's, it looks pro and it's personalized, so that might be an advantage. Great question, Matt. So, uh, yeah, that's a mind blower, but it makes sense if you think about it, right, Brian? Because you know we're so risk averse, 
And there's so many options out there that, you know, if we got, if we trust somebody and we know somebody, it's a colleague or a peer, and they say, you want to go with this. I mean, I've done it. You know, Chris, Chris Stone's recommended stuff and I'm like, done, you know, and it's like, I, I do minimal research because if he's, he's using it and it's working for him, I'm in. And so it's very natural. Uh, shouldn't this be done before or during the presentation? Which part, the, the, the talking points? You want to do it before the presentation, so you're absolutely right. Uh, you want to do it before. I want to, you know, the thing is you want to prep everything before. So I would say do it before. Know what to talk, if there's two things we're doing here. One is that if we're arming the champion, we want our champion to have the information before we do the presentation. So my champion's inside the organization, talking to 11 decision makers, pretty much preparing them for the demo to come. Now, if I'm just doing blind because I don't have a champion, I'll send a survey and hopefully they'll give me some feedback on the survey on what they want me to talk about. So I would do that during the presentation. Now, you have an argument that some people say, you know what, I like to get there, I like to be very interactive and have conversation, ask a lot of questions. Good strategy, here's the downside of that. If there's not a lot of time in there to do the presentation, you kill a lot of time asking a lot of questions. Now, what you can do if you had a survey of some sort before you went in there, I said, but you can say something like this. By the way, I sent out a survey. Some of you got the survey. Some of you responded. And here are your top three to five issues. And here are the things I'm going to cover. Is there anything else from those who didn't participate in the survey that I should also add to this list? And that would be another way of doing it to get everybody on board. So good point. Excellent point. I completely agree with that 67%. Me too, Matthew. Me too, man. Selling cabinets wholesale, usually to one decision maker. We enable them to sell retail by making three-minute videos. Have over 60 so far. This is the same idea, correct? Yeah, I mean, anything that you can do video-wise, if you got one decision maker and, man, you're just loading them up with what they want. I think, Spencer, the key part here is your buyers have certain questions. I think the future is going to be like interactive videos. Now, I think in, the, in this sense, let's take this cabinet. It's such an easy example, but a good example. Let's say that uh, I, wa I have a specific questions about the cabinet and it's like, and I'm watching your video and it said, and then it gives me the options to look at other things like mounting, bam, click on that mount. And now it shows me the mounting portion of it. And then I said, how about staining? Click, boom, staining the actual cabinets. Those are the type of videos that I'll be looking for. I think the interactive video piece is going to become quite interesting in the future, but interactive within the video right now, most of us just send out videos, right? you know, like sequentially, one after the other, each separate by its own. But imagine being able to send out a video where the actual buyer can navigate what video they want to see within the video. I think that's where it's going. So it'll be interesting to see how that works out. Uh, whoa, this is either, this is another gold idea. A video testimonies from our existing clients. That's the big one. That's the big one right there. Thank you, Pete. Uh, oh, what if the champion asks for a cut? I mean, commissions. <laughs> Uh, that's happened before, man. That's happened before. I'll just leave that one alone because I, I've had to deal with that, uh, international markets. And so, uh, it's illegal, I think, to grab commissions. Not a cool thing. If people find out about it, not a great idea. So I'll leave that one alone. Uh, Vinay, thank you very much. Simple framework, but you get the idea. Uh, let me see. Uh, hard work equals reward, especially once you have a system set up. Excellent info, Vic. Thank you, man. Boom. Two thirds are recommendations by peers. I mean, that's that's a big one, man, Chris, isn't it? That is huge. Uh, simple, find a champion. That's why we're in sales. That's the tough part, though, finding a good champion, but also training our champion. That's the key, training our champion. So I agree with this survey and whom we are talking to. I do it all the time. Sudish, thank you very much, man. Thank you for the confirmation. Uh, for surveys, we can use Google Forms. Absolutely. It doesn't have to be complicated. It just lets them know, man. Uh, so cool, cool. Uh, survey and who we're talking to. Sorry, typos. No, I got you. I got you. Don't worry about it. Rod Vidre, where you been, man? All right, here it comes. Here it comes. Uh, where and what's the best way to get your champion and how would you uh, incentivize someone to fill out a survey without dollar slash for the carrots? So first of all, I mean, usually the person that contacts you about your business or your product is probably a good candidate for a champion. That's probably the person that's been designated to do the research. Uh, what's the incentive? I think the, the compelling reasons for them to want to join the demo 
is again, if we're addressing their needs. That's why I think the survey is really interesting. Uh, if you have a champion, you can tell the champion, said, look, here's what we're gonna cover and here's what I need you to communicate with the management buyer, user buyer, technology buyer, economic buyers, right? Here's how, why they should be there. So you gotta give them a why they should be there. You don't have to pay them, just give them a why they should be there because most of these folks are trying to solve a problem that they currently have and hopefully you have the right solution. So I don't think you have to do that. You just have to provide a good enough why they should be there. Um, true champion will create this content if the company will not provide it. Brilliant info. You're right. Uh, and we could wait or let the champion do it, but let's help the champion because, you know, who knows the information better? We do. So let's help the champion. And again, this could be done very simply. We can sit around a round table, figure this all out within a day or two, and then create videos within another day or two, have this ready to go by a week. Uh, hi, Victor. It's 4.30 a.m. here. VV, Thank you for being up so early, man. I hope it's worth your time, man. I hope it is. Ed Hamilton, what's happening? Many buyers within the same company have different buying styles. How do you cater to different buying styles when presenting the same material? Such a hard question to answer, Ed. Answer is I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's a tough one, Ed, right? Because it's, it's one of those things where you almost have to, if you aim too high type A, too serious, you, you lose a lot of people. If you aim too low, let's call them type C, right, more casual buyers, uh, you'll lose the top part. So it's always like trying to find that middle. It's almost like it's always turbulence, right? You know how the airplane's always trying to find the right just to get, you know, to, to get to that steady. And I think it really, it really depends on the audience. I'm, by the way, the answer, so you know I'm not copying out, is it's tough to answer that question. Here's what I do, though. I try to measure language and velocity. So I'm always watching, you know, what I'm saying, how I'm saying it, and how fast I'm saying it. And then I'm always like every two or three minutes trying to get something, you know, ask an engaging question, show something, demo something, something to pull them in. If I'm not getting any like love, if I can put it that way, Ed, then I know that something's not wrong, that something might not be right rather. And so what I then do is ask specific questions. Here's what I learned. If you just say, does anybody have any questions? That doesn't work. That doesn't work. Does anybody have any questions? No. If I know who the players are, I can just say, Ed, let me ask you a question. You're the VP of technology. How would you see implementing this product? Da, 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 da. And this works well, especially in video. This is important. This is an important point. Because if you just say, does anybody have any questions? Bad question to ask. But if I say, Ed, you're in charge of technology. You're the VP or CTO. I said, how do you see this product integrating into dot, dot, dot? Now, Ed wants to chime in because I've asked him a question. When you ask everybody the question, does anybody have any questions? Everybody's waiting for somebody else to answer. And then sometimes some people don't want to answer. So be very targeted when you're asking questions. That's how you know you get the feedback. Now, you also know, Ed, that if you're selling a certain product, you know who the key buyers are, right? For example, let's say that the user buyer, the user actually using the software or the product is gonna make the real decision. Management's there, technology, technical buyers there, economic buyers say, hey, don't let it cost too much. But you know that the real influencers are the users. So then I would be asking questions to the users. Can you see yourself using the software and generating the report much faster than what you're currently doing today? Based on how you're doing it today, does this seem like a better idea? And then you go, hey, John, hey, Jill, you know what I mean? And you'd be very specific on those buyers. So that's one way I would gauge. That's the best I can tell you. But it's a great question, man. Different styles, different approaches. Uh, Victor, I always ask questions uh, to my sponsor separately and in advance before the virtual presentation. Excellent idea. Usually helps customize the presentation is key. Speak their language. However, think that a... Five minute videos are maybe an overkill, but that may be for me. Now, again, it's how you use it, right? So for example, what, you, what you're doing is absolutely correct, which is you're talking to your supporter, your champion, your mobilizer before that. They're giving you a heads up. Now, here's what's interesting. If you tell the, the champion, supporter, hey, I'd like you to send this survey to, to all the decision makers, can you blind copy me? That's what I always ask. Can you blind copy me on there? And they actually do it, that's a good sign. Let me, let me be clear here. So I'm talking, you're my champion, Sudish, right? You're in the company, you're my champion, right? And I say to you, I said, you're, let's say you're the CTO. 
I, t- I say I need a, the, ch- the chief marketing officer to be there. I need the chief sales officer to be there. And I also need, you know, whoever the economic purchasing buyer to be there as well because I want to show some return on investment calculation. Blah. I said, I need four other decision makers to be there. Can you make that happen? Uh, here's an invitation you can send out with a survey of questions as far as what I'd like to know before the meeting. Can you send that out and then blind copy me? Now, here's what's interesting. If the champion doesn't do it, then it always concerns me. When the champion does do it and blind copies me, that's what I know they're selling inside for me. So it's just something to be aware of. Now, on the five minute, could it be overkill? Absolutely. That's where you have to be careful because that's where your champion has to determine. You've, you've trained the champion with the talking points, but maybe the champion senses that the person kind of gets it but doesn't understand. Let the champion make the five minute video delivery, not you. Let them do it. But here's what's also interesting. Maybe you could use it after the demo as a reminder. Say, by the way, I know you had questions about this. Let me go ahead and send you a five-minute video just to make sure I got my point across. So it really depends how you want to use the video. So uh, to your point, yes, it could be overkill, but maybe your champion needs it. I'd rather have, I'd rather the champion have the tools than not have the tools and say, hey, I need this, I need that. So I'd rather have them have everything they need to actually execute that. Uh, let me see. Michelle says... What will be your strategy when a customer says, at this point of time, I'm not sure to invest any money. Uh, I want to play it safe, but I really like your recommendation. Would like to proceed if we work on a profit sharing model, how we handle this type of customer. So when customer says, they, Michelle, when somebody says they want to work on a profit sharing model, they haven't bought into it, right? They want you to take the risk. The problem is you can't control their business model, right? You can't control their business model. So my, 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 I don't know what you're selling, so I would have to understand what you're selling. But when somebody doesn't want to do that and buy into it, you haven't sold the value. Either you haven't sold the value or they don't have the money. I like to believe that you haven't sold the value because I can control that. And if they do have the money, but we haven't sold the value, then I, I, I would look at my presentations. What did I do in the presentation that didn't convince them? Because when somebody says, you know what, I don't know if this is going to work. Why don't we figure out a way to profit share? Like, why don't I just pay you the cost and then whatever profits I make... You know, I'll share that with you. Here's the problem. I can't control their sales team. I can't control how they market their product. I can't control how they use the product. So I have no control over the revenue side. So that's always a bad situation. What I would do is figure out what is it in my product that I'm not selling. If I'm not selling the value, what am I doing wrong? And if you're saying, well, maybe they don't have the money, then I would say to you, then you're targeting the wrong clients. You've got to find clients who do have money. And maybe you're just aiming at the wrong people. So either build your value or find new clients. Those would be my two alternatives. But that whole thing about sharing, I don't have time for that. I couldn't imagine doing that with 10 or 20 clients. You can't manage that. It's not manageable. It's not realistic. Uh, thought video will carry. Uh, yeah, we'll cover the case study aspect. Could be, could be. Vinay, there's no like one way of doing it. I'm just, these are just suggestions and then you can kind of play with how you would want to use them. So yes, I mean, it's a great idea. All right, a couple more and then I'm out of here. Uh, I think explainer video is most important for our business ads. You can use it for business ads as well. Absolutely. Uh, after the sales, you can use the champion to get you referrals. Absolutely, Ryan. You're a hustler, man. Uh, thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, show 100, December 15th. You've already calculated that down already. That's pretty cool. All right. Anyway, let me start wrapping up here. Uh, I know I gave you a lot in a short period of time. So my, my final thoughts for this evening are this. Uh, again, look at how we're trying to get somebody inside a company to sell for us. If we don't equip them with the right tools, then they're going to struggle to sell our message. And if we can't get in, that's a problem. So we need to have a strong champion. Also, consider between the time the date set for the demo and the actual demo, what can you do in between to shorten that sales cycle, educate the buyer, give them the information they need. So when they get to the demo, you're not starting from zero. You're starting from, let's say, 30 or 40 percent of where you want to be. And then that is a more valuable conversation. Again, to I think it was Vinay who said the more information you have up front, absolutely, before you go in is wonderful. And that's where a champion can feed you that information. But remember, we need to get the decision makers in that room. So if I can use the time between I set the demo and the actual demo, if I can use that time in between somehow using case studies, testimonials, really selling hard the actual demo, who should be there, really pushing that message, then 
I'll get more people in that actual demo. And I think that's the key point because remember, we want to shorten the sales cycle because if I shorten the sales cycle, I can increase my close rate. And on that note, this is Victor Antonio signing up with another Sales After Dark, always reminding you, sell it ain't hard when you know how. And again, check out the Sales Influence Podcast or go to my website and check out my Sales Velocity Academy. We'll see you.